Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa We continue reading from the beginning of guidance. We did today by Imam Ghazal rahmanullah wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa And we have reached uh, part three. This is page 128 of Mashad al-Laf's translation. The etiquette of companionship with the Creator and the creation. Al-Qawlu fi adab al-Suhbati wal-Mu'ashar ma'al khaliq wal-Khalq. Imam Ghazali said, and know that your companion, the one who never parts from you, whether you are at home or you are traveling, whether you are asleep or awake, and indeed in your life and at your death. Is none other than your Lord your protector, your master, and your creator. Whenever you engage in remembrance of him, he is with you. As Allah Most High says, I am the companion, the uh, The, uh, the narration is similar to a hadith Qudsi, I say, similar to a hadith Qudsi because uh, it is not. I am the companion of the one who engages in the remembrance of me. Okay. Um, and let's basically continue the next to uh, reading the next two lines because at the end of these two uh, lines there is another part of the same hadith that are mentioned separately and then we will comment on this hadith inshallah and whenever your heart breaks with sorrow over your shortcomings in fulfilling the rights of your lord Indeed, he is your friend and constant companion. As your Lord Most High says, I am, this is the second part, I am with those whose hearts are broken for my sake. In fact, the translator uh, attributed the, uh, these two parts to two different sources. The first one to Shu'ab al-Iman and the second one to Hiliyat uh, al-Awliya. Now, first of all, this is from the uh, the source is Ka'b al-Ahbar, definitely. Uh, and there is no sound chain of narrators to attribute it to the Prophet ﷺ. The second point, of course, Ka'b al-Ahbar is uh, um, he was a Jewish scholar uh, from Yemen. So when you read uh, about him, he is Ka'b bin Mata. Al-Himyari al-Yamani, he uh, became Muslim after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ka'ab came to the Medina during the time of Umar uh, al-Khattab, meaning, meaning that um, during the time when Sayyid Umar al-Khattab was the uh, Khalifa, Amir Mu'minin. And uh, from the uh, narrations about uh, Jerusalem, we know that uh, Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab concluded uh, the, uh, the pact of, uh, of Umar al-Ahd al-Umariya with Patrick Sophronius in Jerusalem, there several stories. One of these stories, uh, it seems that uh, it, the story involves Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab and uh, uh, Ka'b al-Ahbar at 
the site of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Wallah alam. Now, this narration with, with both parts is the narration, uh, the wording, because it has been mentioned by other, uh, in other companion of hadith. This is the narration of Imam Ahmad in the book of, uh, of Zuhd. And uh, it stipulates the following. The wording is like this. عن كعب قال قال موسى عليه السلام. So it's not عن كعب قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال موسى عليه السلام. Is, the Prophet is not part of the صلى الله عليه وسلم. Uh, our beloved Prophet is not part of the uh, of the narration. But there is a hadith. Uh, Narrated by Bukhari Muslim, it does have the uh, the the essence of this hadith, like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala being with the one who mentions his name, and I will mention the hadith, and I will highlight the part that is relevant. An Abi Hurairah رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يقول الله تعالى أنا عند ظن عبدي بي وأنا معه إذا ذكرني. This is really the uh, the uh, the ma'iya, if you will, أنا معه إذا كرني. أنا I am with him when he, if he uh, mentions me, if he remembers me, if he uh, makes remembrance of uh, of my name. فإن ذكرني في نفسي ذكرت في نفسي في mentions me in in his heart. Uh, you know, I mention uh, I mention him. Uh, like if if it's not really public, it's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, we'll mention him if it's in public. We end up in a female. in khayr And if he mentions me, uh, you know, uh, amongst uh, a group of people, I, mention, I will mention him in a better uh, group. Uh, and in a better group, it could be the angels, for example, or Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will facilitate the uh, that his name will be mentioned uh, amongst a group of. Uh, uh, of good people, a better uh, group, also on uh, in this life. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala alam, alam alam. If you knew him truly, as he should be known, if you know, if you knew Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, فلو عرفته حق معرفته. You would take him. As your companion, and leave people aside. If you are not able to do this all the time, then be aware of leaving your entire night and day devoid of a time spent alone with with your master. Therein to taste the sweetness of intimate dialogue with him. Uh, for this, you must learn the manners of companionship with Allah, mighty and majestic. The sweetness of intimate dialogue really is about munaja. Literally, dialogue involves uh, there is a, a narrative that is coming from two uh, two sides. Well, uh, one might say, the, uh, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to us? Yes, the Quran, the revelation. So you respond. But really, it's, uh, you might, uh, in the middle of the night, before Fajr, uh, even the middle of the day, you might have a time when you simply address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To forgive you, to guide you, to protect you, to uh, because the preoccupation one might bring to the picture. Uh, either you have defeated uh, your, uh, you, you have defeated the this, like you are in control of your own desires. Okay, you have defeated Hawa. So if you have desire, uh, they are fulfilled uh, within the realm of halal, not haram. 
someone who is defeated by Hawa, by Satan. Uh, defeated one might uh, this is a very sad uh, situation and uh, the third the third state is that you have an ongoing struggle between Ba'ith al-Din wa Ba'ith al-Hawa okay so The uh, the angelic forces against the uh, forces of Satan, and the uh, battlefield is your heart. So uh, it depends on one state. One would be thankful. One would be uh, would be asking for forgiveness. And let's remember what Imam Ghazali says. You might say Astaghfirullah, but Imam Ghazali says. It's better to say Allahumma ghfirli because astaghfirullah it means that you have repented. Maybe you didn't. But say Allahumma ghfirli, Allahumma ghfirli ala, ala jami' ahwali. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. The manners of this, of this company, of this companionship, the manners of this company are keeping the eyes downcast. Full concentration, remaining silent, stillness of the limbs, hastening to fulfill his command, his, Allah's command, avoiding prohibited things, minimal objection to what he decrees for you. Constant remembrance of him. Persevering in contemplation. Giving preference to the truth. That is Allah by turning to him over all else. al -haq. Despairing of created beings. They cannot benefit themselves, mind you, benefit you. Humility with extreme. And we talk about the uh, affairs of the hereafter. And when you do render your support in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated that. Just remember. It doesn't mean that you don't thank. People for uh, their help if they do. Humility with extreme reverence before Allah's majesty. A feeling of brokenness. Coupled with modesty. Peace of mind. Without resorting to any strategy for earning livelihood. by having confidence in the guarantee of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and complete trust in the grace of Allah and complete trust in the grace of Allah mighty and majestic knowing with certainty that the best choice will always be the one he makes These etiquette, all of them should constitute your distinguishing emblem in all your nights and days. 
they are the spiritual courtesies of companionship with a friend meaning with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who never leaves your side even as everyone of creation will part company with you at one time or another the etiquette of the scholar if you are a scholar then the manners of a scholar that you must have are ample tolerance keeping to forbearance gravity and a dignified bearing when in the company of people Refraining from showing haughtiness toward any slave of Allah, except for tyrants, as a deterrent to their oppressive behavior. Preferring a lowly status in gatherings and meetings. Lowly status, being humble. You don't seek to sit in the most prominent place. You don't want to be served first. You don't want to be addressed, you know, by a few lines of titles. Avoidance of jesting and making jokes. Gentleness with the student. Showing patience and equanimity with the student or questioner who is haughty. Correcting the dull-witted with excellent guidance. And not becoming annoyed with them. Not to be too proud to say, I don't know. Remember that the uh, true scholars would not shy away from saying, I don't know. Especially, uh, we talk about uh, live programs whereby people uh, send their questions uh, written or they call live and they ask questions. If you don't know the answer, say, I don't know. I'll work on the answer, and inshallah, and then during the next episode, I will uh, address this question, whatever. Don't shy away from saying, I don't know. Devoting your full attention to the questioner and genuinely attempting to understand his question. We ask people not to play with their phone, like, you know, not to be distracted. Same thing, don't be distracted. Give people your full attention. Trying to understand. So sometimes people, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, reality. Sometimes people need someone to listen to them. They're not looking for a... Uh, for an answer specifically, I mean, they, they have, you are not a psychologist, you are not a, but sometimes you might uh, play the role of some, what is called in the West today, uh, like a chaplain, okay, people need to, to talk sometimes, Just sit for, for a couple of minutes, not during the uh, your your dars, your lecture, your teaching, your official formal teaching. After the prayer, after your dars, after. Just give people a couple of minutes of your time. Fully accepting another's proof in a debate. 
And this is really uh, something that uh, you should always, uh, you don't have to be the one who is uh, superior in the debate. If, if your intention is that to reveal the truth, to reach the truth, you should not worry that uh, someone else, uh, quote unquote, your, op your opponent, will say that which is right. Just accept it. Submitting to the truth and returning to it when you realize you are wrong. Preventing the student from learning any branch of knowledge that will harm him. I think there is uh, a need for a serious uh, review of uh, the curriculum of many universities. Here it talks definitely about uh, Islamic scholarship, and I'm talking about the wider picture. Every university has a philosophy of education. What is it? If the university provides, for example, in our part of the world provides uh, between four and six uh, courses in English and hardly one course in Arabic, maybe two credit hours. And uh, they might say, well, they are, they are Arabs. They should know the language. That's not, that's not true. The fact that they speak Arabic is like, you know, a person who never uh, went to university, they speak the same language. There should be a higher level for educated people. After all, it's the language of the Quran. And then, you know, what courses should be uh, university requirements? These courses should reflect uh, the cultural background of the, uh, of the society. Those who uh, you have for for us, we have almost fifteen hundred years of uh, of scholarship. Fourteen hundred years of scholarship, and we can choose uh, many of uh, many of those scholars to be presented in uh, in courses. There is a tradition in the West. The hundred great books of uh, Western civilization. What are our one hundred great books of Islamic civilization? So preventing the student from learning any branch of knowledge that will harm him, deterring the student from desiring in his pursuit of useful knowledge anything other than the countenance of Allah Most High, and preventing the student from occupying himself with the command, or the communal rather, or the communal obligations before he has completed his individual obligations. His own primary individual obligation is to rectify his outward and inward with consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taking account of himself first, so that the student may follow him in actions first, benefiting from his example, and benefiting from his words second. What he mentioned by, uh, of course, the uh, commun communal and uh, individual uh, Obligations. This is the difference between Fard al Kifaya and Fard al Ain. Fard al Kifaya is uh, the, a communal obligation that, if it ha if it is fulfilled by one or more persons, but you know, to the uh, then the rest of the community uh, are not at fault. In Hiyarum al Din, Imam Ghazali says there should be a you know a Muslim 
physician in every uh, town. That's a communal, communal obligation. If it's fulfilled by one or two or three or five, then uh, there is no uh, responsibility anymore uh, for the community at large. The Fard uh, al-Ain, the Da'as, basically uh, every Muslim, and usually when you say every Muslim, it means he is uh, a, he or she reached maturity, sane, so obviously capable. Taking account of himself first so that the student may follow him in actions first, benefiting from his example and benefit from his words second. Um, this is something that uh, in, uh, in the universe today, uh, the professor shows up, you know, uh, teaches, took about three credit hours. Uh, it might be divided into three uh, uh, contact hours during the week. It could be two. Uh, it could be one um, seminar. What do you learn from the professor in the classroom? Talk about practice. if he's going to disappear after the uh, lecture. This is why Al-Attas, uh, Sayyidina Muhammad Al-Qibir Al-Attas, Hafidhahullah, Warahimahu, Warahimana, an inter Muslim intellectual with very deep insight, uh, into the Islamic worldview and to human psyche, a Sufi really. Uh, he he uh, established STAC, the International Institute for Islamic Thought and Civilization. Uh, he wanted the professors and the students, these are graduate students, there, is, there are no uh, bachelor degrees at STAC. Unfortunately, politics. Uh, his patron was uh, Anwar Ibrahim, the uh, the Malaysian uh, uh, politician. But this uh, this was uh, unfortunately uh, when things changed and when there were uh, forces against Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia. Uh, uh, so like, it was almost like a coup d'etat, and were Rahim to the to, to the prison, and the Sayyid Muhammad uh, though he established the stack, a wonderful place uh, academically and otherwise, a meeting of the minds and uh, souls, if you will. Uh, but uh, he was, uh, re you know, removed from his uh, stack, and it became like any other. Uh, faculty, uh, any other department within the International Islamic University of uh, in uh, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. So, Sayyid Hamid al wanted professors and students to live together, not in one apartment, but to live in the same uh, complex, so that they could learn uh, from each other. Uh, like the Nizami of Baghdad, you would live around your professor, you would see your professor, how he performs wudu, how he deals with students, how he deals with the needy, how he deals with questioners, how he deals with the those in the uh, authority. Uh, you'll be around them, you'll see them in the uh, in the mosque, you'll see them in the uh, in the school, you'll see them. A real, a real uh, example. Mm. 
Inshallah, uh, tomorrow we'll deal with the etiquette of the student. Uh, like, of course, when we mention one, we mention the other, but uh, there's a, a specific entry for the uh, for the etiquette, the adab, uh, adab al mutaallim. Until then, inshallah, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu wa la tasakhir kutub alayk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.